And I remember going to see a French fi uh, banker saying to me, oh, you're talking about like if some industry wants to, to have fun and find like, that that's love money. Because I was a woman, he said to me, oh, that's love money. As no equity today is a very, it's a good question and, and we should uh, really maybe uh, think of it. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are live now. We are on the Marché du Fil platform and also on YouTube. Thanks for being connected and thanks for attending this event. My name is Sarah Brunet. I'm working for the European Commission and especially for the Creative Europe Media Program. Um, I'm here I'm, uh, to introduce uh, this showcase on behalf of Lucia Recalde who's the head of the media program at the DG Connect. This showcase is the last one of a series of four showcases uh, started at the beginning of this week in partnership with the Marché du Film. And um, the global concept of these showcases is to hear and dialogue with the professionals of the, of the audiovisual industry to share their experience day to day their difficulties, their good practices, and their advice, especially in this COVID context. Today, the topic of this showcase is access to finance for women entrepreneurs. Why this topic? In French, we say l'argent, c'est le nerf de la guerre. And we thought it was important to focus on this issue because if we want the global situation to improve for gender parity. Of course, money is, a, is an important issue and women have to access to the banks and also to uh, investment funds as men do. And uh, also, of course, we are talking about the access, but also the amount. And um, so today we have two very high level speakers to talk about this, uh, Julie Gaillet and Julianne Schulz, thanks a million for accepting our invitation and to be part of this discussion. We very much look forward uh, for what you have to say on this topic. Uh, also, I want to uh, introduce Tamara Tatishvili, who is working for the European uh, Women Audiovisual Network. Uh, she's the um, strategic manager and she will be moderating this discussion. Uh, thanks very much to accept this partnership with media. And um, before I give the floor to Tamara, I um, want to say that, of course, with media, we are very much committed uh, to improve the gender balance and globally speaking, parity and diversity. And this uh, very um, unprecedented crisis uh, don't have to, um, to uh, put uh, back this issue. And uh, since uh, one year and a half, we've been implementing a special agenda closely with uh, stakeholders. And we've been doing uh, several activities because we think an holistic view is needed on this special topic. So for instance, last year we have published a, a good practices guide and also we have uh, launched a dedicated event in Cannes called Women in the Move. So this showcase is a sort of continuity of this uh, global uh, strategy. And uh, of course, I also want to say that for the, for the first time in history, we have a woman as a president, Ursula von der Leyen, and of course, parity and diversity are very close to her heart. So um, I have talked enough and um, thanks again for participating to this showcase. Uh, Tamara, the floor is yours and uh, thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Sarah, for a thorough introduction. Uh, so my name is Tamara. I represent European Women Audiovisual Network. And before I go into the very complex subject that we are trying to tackle today, let me wholeheartedly congratulate everyone who's made this online edition of Marche possible. I think we've been part of a very special uh, experience. I think industry jointly really made it happen. And everyone, you, Sarah, your unit, all people, horizontal and vertical present on this market, we should really have a drink tonight because it may, we made sense out of it and a lot of people worked for it behind the scene. Uh, without further ado, I'm uh, very happy that we are co-hosting this um, talk together with you because the EWA network is obviously active, is a member organization and our agenda is to act on the further promotion of uh, equality. Uh, we are a member organization that brings together knowledge for our members. We're trying to put mentorship programs for them. We try to uh, boost their professional capacities and try to advocate that equality agenda is not a topic for women only. It's a topic for everyone. It echoes the issues of democracy. And if we all are equal, then we will be also inclusive. We will let all others be part of it. So we will be diverse. And uh, I hope that um, uh, this message will spread more and more. Uh, Sarah has already outlined eloquently the angle of the commission and on the units uh, that she represents. And I'm now privileged to first um, give a special welcome to the two guests. Uh, so for me, on the right side of the screen is Julie Gaillet, uh, uh, producer, actress, director from France, someone who's been multitasking in the in the creative industries let's say and you are here uh, to share your practitioner experience your real life experiences which would be very happy uh, and interesting for for our viewers um, it's interesting to know that you are ceo of three different companies if i'm not wrong so it's rouge international it's cinema four it's Amarant International, no? Well, you'll tell us more about your, uh, um, yes. Um, bonjour, bonjour. <laughs> but um, on the other hand, you are, you've been also the, on the juries of important festivals. So you, you have an angle there as well and an experience. And what's the most interesting probably is your activism, Julie, in the field of the gender equality. We know that you are an outspoken professional on this topic and you've been also part of professional organizations. And I think you are also actively promoting uh, female women health issues. So later on, it will be very interesting to know more about the kind of films you are doing, where did you meet blockages and uh, why, in your own opinion. And on the right hand, I have uh, Juliane Schulze, who is coming from Germany and who certainly is a seasoned professional who is working in the creative industries with uh, cross-industrial cross knowledge, I would say, specializing in finance, responsible innovation and the business consulting of tech-driven startups. You are uh, the senior partner at the strategic finance uh, consultancy, Peaceful Fish, but you are also on the board of a European investor network, which I find very interesting, that brings together business angels and early stage venture capital funds focusing on creative industries and digital media. And I think we will benefit a lot from you, Juliane, to to place a little bit the parts of the puzzle, where do they belong, and to collectively find a way um, forward. And before we go into this discussion, I welcome all the viewers um, that are now connected on different channels. As many of you already know, there is a Q&A um, button here on the screen. Please feel free uh, writing up your questions. Uh, we will try to have 40 to 45 minutes conversation between the two professionals that are meant to be in the limelight today. And uh, then I will be, of course, uh, 
checking what's happening on the chat and try my best to uh, voice the questions uh, to both of them, uh, depending on, on the interests of the listeners and the viewers. So when I again read the title of this um, showcase, I thought, wow, we have something like less than an hour and we want to see what are the issues that female entrepreneurs are facing, why, and also we want to navigate in, uh, in an industry where we know that film finance really requires a lot of upfront investment and is accompanied with a lot of risk because it's not given that the commercial viability is attached to any project that is done in this field, especially if we look into the traditional way of producing cinema, put it that way. It's obviously known for the professional viewers here that due to that and for many other political and cultural reasons, there are a lot of financing schemes existent in Europe that uh, are nurturing cultural diversity and are nurturing the financing of uh, European cinema, international cinema to make it travel, to make it happen and to reach out with the good values that this cinema needs to promote. There is also an uh, evidence and we have no time to tickle each and every report or the blueprint and the parliament paper with the research. But what we also see, and I'm looking at you, Juliane, is that uh, companies founded by or co-founded by women have somewhat better returns in a due time. Uh, female leads are um, socially very responsible. They are also becoming um, uh, very uh, confident as an investors. On the other hand, we see some of the industry reports and we see the distribution of the funds that 99% of European venture capital financing, for instance, goes to male-led firms. And that the refusal rate towards the women-led uh, companies is higher, somewhere like 5-6% higher than of those uh, pitched by their male counterparts. And there are a lot of examples of this kind, which we cannot really list in 45 minutes. But what we could try to understand with the expertise of the two of you is where does the problem start? Because the uh, creative uh, entrepreneurship of women is probably something that we need to first visit and then put it in a bigger picture of seeing why access to finance is becoming a complexity and then come to the real times, which is now called post-COVID. So Juliane, I would like to start with you. Maybe you help us understand if there is an evidence out there that we have a good pool of female entrepreneurs already and it's only the moment to access of finance when the problems are created. And then I'll um, turn to Julie and ask her uh, good experiences, good or more challenging experiences on, on the road of financing. Thank you very much, Tamara, for uh, your welcoming and introduction. And uh, to go straight <clears throat> to your question, I think um, uh, the, the very uh, term entrepreneurship, female entrepreneurship, already puts one of the main problems into our faces. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it's not self-evident that businesses are created by uh, female founders, that uh, women lead uh, corporations, manage businesses. It's still in regards to numbers clear that, um, uh, let's say, male management is more um, the dominant picture we are seeing. So it's, it's still something we need to uh, support, I believe, in, in uh, uh, the group of women. Female leadership needs to be supported. Everything that has to do with um, wrapping your vision into a business model, so to speak. So I, I see that um, in, in the work we do, that really goes across several, several sectors like film, television, games, um, uh, fashion, uh, and, and of course music, you know, there's uh, a dominance of, of uh, uh, men in uh, business uh, functions. 
And this is not the only problem. I think the second aspect of the problem is that um, we are, of course, in the midst of a digital transition of the audiovisual sector. So um, more and more companies, startups are created to offer interesting and badly needed digital solutions uh, uh, for this transition process. And uh, again, we have not enough um, women who um, embark on, uh, you know, creating a digital company, going into uh, building digital businesses. So in the end, what we see is that um, this great opportunity that this transition process offers is uh, mostly taken up by men who, of course, build solutions for a need that they have been seeing in the market. So we are missing out on an opportunity, uh, I mean, not 100%, obviously, there are many female uh, founders in this area who really try and are really very good at what they're doing, but in regards to statistics, it's quite obvious. And I think it's important that, uh, particularly um, uh, the, the approach that women take, who are often concerned with uh, responsible practices, uh, are creating businesses that have a social, uh, um, uh, impact, for example, and really look at fairness and, and uh, equality uh, measures in, in, in their activities to implement, for example, you know, blockchain, uh, XR, AR uh, technologies to come up with solutions that include and, and enable transparency and uh, in that sense also help the investors and financiers to uh, be confident in, in, in participating in investment processes because everything, be it in content management, in rights management, or financial transactions, would then be so much more easy to access by everybody. So there are several aspects to this. Thank you very much. And let me let me turn. I think what what you've uh, said also echoes the fact that. Uh, there is a gap in the, there's a pay gap when you look at the men and women. There, there are issues with the uh, family obligations and work-life balance, which also we know uh, that uh, holds some women back. And all this makes the complexity of this agenda. This is why uh, probably we always need to put the bigger picture to understand how much of a layers need to be treated through programs and the support to make the final result tangible. But of course, we have Julie here, who's been, uh, uh, who's been on this road. And uh, we know that uh, working as a producer or a creative, uh, it all, probably almost always looks quite wonderful on screen. But there are a lot that's happening backstage that are challenging, difficulties are on this path. And especially when you try to put project together and uh, find financing for it. So could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, the move towards the producing, the eagerness that you wanted to, 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 to achieve, and then uh, share a little bit on this challenges part. Yes, and um, thank you very much for letting me participate. I feel very very uh, again not uh, legitimate which is one of the biggest problem with women uh, feeling le legitimate on doing uh, on talking on 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 becoming opening a company i started as an actress so it's probably different because i even less feel legitimate because i didn't do a school as a producer i was an actress and i started uh, very young when I was 20 years old with Agnes Varda was my one of the first director I worked with and she was very um, sensible to that subject but as she said like um, very recently because I became a co-producer on Faces Places so um, nearly 30 years after uh, we worked together that she uh, Effectivement, uh, the, the money is le nerf de la guerre, is, is, is the thing, because she was saying everyone are giving me honors, awards, I don't want awards, I want money. <laughs> that is the thing, give me money, stop saying, and how uh, it is, uh, it is the, 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 the question, and it's, uh, 
in the entrepreneuriat, which even you said that you were talking about the digital, but for a new startup, it's the same. There is a group of women in France that are working, which I really like. Um, they say that uh, um, we need to count women for, they, for them to count, that it's really important to know that only 2% of money are going on investment on, on, on companies. So, so I really was uh, very happy when 50, 50, 50, uh, collective 50-50 yeah. uh, uh, arrived in France. So we have numbers to understand because I felt that it's our own bones as well. The fact that we really uh, stop ourselves, uh, that is a big subject with women. Uh, it took me 10 years to say, okay, I'm going to be a producer. Okay, because maybe probably I was an actress and there were very little actresses, no actresses producing films that she wasn't playing as a producer, becoming a producer. So I, it, it took me times to do that. And I had role models as Agnès Varda. So I really wanted to understand why it took me so much time to, to, to do that first step. And when I see the, 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 the numbers, I am very surprised that when you have... Uh, for the script women, 96% uh, of the script women, they paid a little bit more than men, 9%, which is very rare. There are maybe two, uh, only two types of women on a, on a set that are actually paid more than men. But the makeup and hair, they're 90% of our women makeup and hair, and they're paid 15% less than men, why? And so I, as a producer said, we need to, uh, to make statistics, to try to um, get conscious of why uh, we have that chance. So I ask all the director of production I'm working with on my films to speak to them, just I wanted to understand. And then I realized that they never, they, they never ask for uh, more money. They never even, um, arg uh, argument. So I was very surprised of that. So I think it, uh, we women are have a problem with actually. Um, uh, sorry, I, I, it's more uh, um, um, going for it. I would say for the confidence. Need I to, think you wanted to. Yeah, no, need to prove more. Need to be more reassured. We have all the all the elements before we go and get. Uh, uh, and, and that's I think the, the get, message, get message understood because you're you're tackling something very important that is also part of the agenda where you, uh, under which we are trying to to construct this picture. Juliana, I what the representation. Sorry, sorry. I think we have a bit of an issue with uh, with the sound. But what about the um, Juliana? I'm asking you um, the skills. And what about the confidence and boosting and the visibility of, uh, um, of female entrepreneurs, not only the ones that are working in a specific territory and enjoying uh, uh, the existing uh, financing structures that are possibly mostly driven by subsidies, but in general, you know, the ones that want to be more experimental, they want to embrace digital as well. How do we, where, where are the weaknesses and how could professional associations and programs existing on the European level support and help from your experience? Yeah, I think it's um, uh, totally playing into what Julie just said. Um, there's a sense uh, of humbleness, a sense of uh, stepping back, uh, being uh, uh, rather overprepared before doing the first step. There's a certain shyness in taking risks. Um, there's certainly not enough confidence in, in many female founders uh, and, and, and uh, also film producers to um, uh, just do things before having thought through each and every aspect uh, of the, the, the risks. And I think this more test and trial um, uh, approach uh, that also boys have, you know, they are much more risk taking in, 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 in simple play games or uh, something. Uh, also, also already shows that there's something like a difference between uh, uh, the male and the female approach. So I think we, we need to empower women much more. We need to give them uh, much more access to role models like uh, Agnes Varda, like uh, you know, great female 
leaders. We have to um, enable them to, to understand what the DNA of an entrepreneur really is and to connect this understanding with uh, the fact that they are all entrepreneurs, often not knowing that they are already deep into building something very profound. And I keep seeing more and more um, young uh, uh, founders and, and also people in, in the audiovisual sector who are very concerned and very active to, to work towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Yes. And you know, after some time of a conversation, it sort of comes out. And when I then tell them, look, isn't this exactly what uh, the UN SDGs are about? They're like, oh, really? You know, so there's so much they do and often so little uh, they um, are, are conscious about. And I think um, that is a big uh, hindrance. That's a big problem. In other words, we need to help female uh, uh, producers, founders, entrepreneurs to look at what they do much more from uh, the perspective of, of the assets that they are creating on a daily basis and to be much more able to articulate what they do and why they do it, particularly why they do it and to wrap it in a way that um, a third party can understand it and see it you know, as this kind of profound opportunity and uh, to, to drill deeper into what the business might be about. So I think we need to be almost empowered on all levels and uh, need to understand that uh, most of the things uh, that female um, founders, entrepreneurs are doing uh, and not reflect on are already on a very interesting and novel path. And uh, this needs to be highlighted. This needs to be kind of communicated and promoted in a different way. So a lot of mentoring needs to go into entrepreneurship training, leadership training, uh, communication skills. And, and if you would go through all of this, you would come out <laughs> much more like that and uh, probably perform different. Yes, and uh, this leads me to, uh, well, you are also on the board of our network, Juliana, and you know that we are trying to do as much as possible a lot on, on the mentorship uh, side. And uh, uh, it was very interesting for me to hear Julie, you know, ev even though she's been exposed to the industry uh, in her acting capacities and she's been part of it in different ways, she still had those issues and she's openly speaking about it. Now imagine um, the territories that are much lower on the production capacities. And I always take myself as someone who belongs to the industry. I've been doing different kinds of jobs and been there on the production side myself. If you look into smaller territories that are not even yet as sophisticated in financial structures like France or any other um, European country could be. Um, I, there are women who are uh, making wonders. They are producing, they are co-producing. And as you said, like in countries like, I don't know, Bosnia, Georgia, Ukraine, you name them, you know, with political turmoil, with artistic expression sometimes being totally under risk and they are making it happen, you know, like for instance, Julie's been, Julie's been indicating. So I think we should really go on um, empowering and make these empowerment programs really very concrete. And what I hear from you, Juliana, it is access to decision-making positions, because I think next thing we could tackle is if there are enough female on those investment boards who can be sensitive to the applications coming out of female entrepreneurs, be it on a digital or um, traditional field. And also we need to be sure that women who do a lot but do not reflect how much they are acting on this agenda are uh, brought to it and are more vocal about it, like uh, Julie's membership to Collective 5050 and many other national associations that exist on um, under this agenda. But um, I'm wondering, Julie, if you've been financing projects from um, alternative uh, fun funders, let's say, have you ever reached out to banks or other guarantee facilities and tried to 
um, get uh, funding from a project from from the ones that you've been uh, on board of. Because I'm asking this because I would like to see if you have any experience, a challenge, or maybe a very positive uh, exercise that played on your road. And if not, then we'll ask uh, Juliane to explain us what's the problem there. Because very often in our industry, people call it, oh, it's a different world, the alternative financing. So let's see a little bit what's happening in this different world. Um, it's funny because I uh, really realized when there was in 2007, the, in the, the financial crisis, that in America, that they were doing 600 and more films that they did half of those films. And in France, we nearly didn't change the numbers of film. We still produced 260 films. So it, and it nearly didn't change. So the crisis didn't impact the French finances. So I realized that all the uh, smaller budget, the uh, independent film in America were, were financed by H funds, by alternative finances. And then I realized that in France, we do not use these type of different way of looking for uh, equity, which I could say, or, and I remember going to see a French fi uh, banker saying to me, oh, you're talking about like if some industry wants to, to have fun and find like that, that's love money. Because I was a woman, he said to me, oh, that's love money. As no equity today is a very, it's a good question and, and we should, uh, really maybe uh, think of it so i was very surprised then how because i wanted to look somewhere else maybe uh, in private equity uh -huh. uh, the banker didn't took me seriously then and then we finally made for example if i still speak about anies varda last film we did found money that was equity that was not love money that was serious and the people get their money back and it was really with um like any finances any um sofica any other way of financing and so um again it's um a way of being uh, um uh, sure of yourself or confident let's say self-confident and, and inventing or trying something new but um, I would say more that uh, with this age fund, I realized as well that uh, for women, there is something about uh, a level of uh, uh, money you're asking. So in documentaries, it's okay. First film, and then when you get to big budget, that is the big question. And mm -hmm. I realized that as a producer. So here in France, the, the, there was a big scandal because the biggest budget last year was Roman Polanski film. And why after Me Too, why after all this happened, some producers decided to put 22 million on a, a Roman Polanski film while on the other side, women have very much difficulties to get bigger budget. We just are always stuck on something that is difficult to, to go mm -hmm. upper. Juliane, I heard you talking because you are also one of the coaches and mentors on the training uh, school of film advancement, which is uh, um, actually also supported partially by Creative Europe Media. And there I often hear you saying, uh, talking about uh, this alternative world of financing and you're trying to uh, push participants, I would say, towards thinking out of box, which is not always easy, right? Uh, it really needs a little bit of a different mindset and maybe sometimes uh, um, stepping back from your uh, uh, dreams and becoming a bit more pragmatic on issues. So could you explain that in the film world and talk your experience uh, with the banks as well? <clears throat> yeah, let me um, maybe start with the banks um, and, and try to, to quickly uh, share um, with you what we learned in the process of, of dealing with banks and also in, in the run up to building uh, the cultural and creative sector guarantee facility. So what we um, have been hearing um, and seeing a lot is that um, after, during and after the crisis, the financial crisis, banks closed their department, their media and entertainment departments. So banks are now left with staff 
uh, which does not understand uh, the value uh, creation and to the exploitation uh, processes in, in the film and audiovisual slash entertainment um, industry. So because they don't understand it, they uh, must regard it as high risk. And uh, if they are not um, uh, blessed with a background in structured finance and do not have, let's say, industry connections that can highlight and explain what is what and how you can lend against contracts and all these kind of cash flowing products and so on, you are really uh, advised to keep your fingers off. So this is what they do. They don't understand it. They don't get involved. Those who have an understanding, and you could call them expert lenders in Europe, and it's just a handful left, um, they often look at um, the, the administrative costs uh, in, in um, uh, you know, providing loans. And uh, these costs are high and often too high given the needed funds. So then again, it's not an attractive business for banks and they rather not offer the loans. So um, in that sense, uh, it was very advisable when in uh, 2016, um, the, um, the uh, sector guarantee facility was uh, put into place. It's run by the European Investment Fund on uh, behalf of the European Commission. And it tries basically to help house banks of a film producer, for example, or other cultural and creative actors to um, extend loans and to uh, cover a significant part of the, the risk. Mm -hmm. But it's not 100% of the risk they are covering. And so again, many banks say, well, you know, that bit of remaining risk is not for us uh, to handle that we cannot uh, uh, cover. So these are some aspects that we have been uh, observing a lot. So of course, this puts more pressure on finding alternative financing sources and as rightfully say, <laughs> keep pushing and pulling uh, and try to, to bring um, you know, participants of training prop, uh, programs to this notion that there are other um, ways of financing. And in order to do that, I think it's important to understand um, uh, one important thing. Um, first of all, film is a value proposition. And right there, many people go like, pardon, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know, if you look at a film as a value pro uh, uh, proposition, um, you, you turn either to your uh, public funds and piece together 15 different uh, territories in your financing mix and, and try to make your funding body happy and hope for an audience to see your film. But if you go for the alternative uh, model, um, uh, and that brings the other aspect of value, value as in convictions and beliefs. In that sense, a value proposition offers you completely different routes and a different space. And this space, um, uh, you would enter first by asking, why do I do this film? You know, what does it stand for? How do I add value to my audience? And uh, why would my audience care for my film and not go to see a blockbuster? So you begin to think much more market oriented and audience oriented. And with that in place, you also build relationships much earlier. You begin to describe your project in a different way. And you are able to bring partners on board who would otherwise not even notice you. And I think this is, you know, on a very high level uh, without going into uh, much detail, the, the, the difference in mindset. And um, in that sense, you would then be able to talk to high net worth individuals, to brands, you would be able to uh, access equity uh, that is not love uh, money, but why not also love money? <laughs> it's never bad. But this kind of different perspective, I think is um, important to be able to access alternative finance. Sorry, uh, we are already, um, we have some 15, 20 minutes maximum, actually. That's been a challenge and an ambition to cover such a complex topic, but I, I, I hope we are uh, giving some clear indications in the direction, and I'm, I'm sure that the organizers would be happy to you know, follow, follow on on a, on a more concrete actions on that. Uh, I want to leave some time and recap. There's a lot on the chat window as well, so I'll try to do it in a minute. But before we go there, I would like to I have your quick replies, if possible, on, um, on the situation post-pandemic. 
I have a view that a lot of um, things um, that we probably called normal do need to validly be questioned now. And if it is because of the pandemic and if it has escalated and if we can go to a healthier, more inclusive environment and making it less, um, or less elitist, elitistic and really boost uh, di diverse presence in the industry, diverse content on screen, off screen, that can be only good. So I'm wondering to the, the opinion of the two of you on a post COVID uh, situation and whether the financing could be uh, more complicated to be obtained or not. And then I'll try to uh, highlight some of the questions that we have on the chat. So, Julie, maybe you start and then, uh, yeah. I am actually producing a film of a woman director called Dinara Drukarova, and the film is the adaptation of a book called A Woman at Seas. We have to shoot on the sea, and it's nearly an action film. It needs um, um, a lot of technicity. And actually, she's always asked if she's capable of doing this film. Oh, how strange. But anyway, it's a, it's a film on the sea and it, we, we're doing a co-production with France, Quebec and Canada and um, Belgium. But at the moment, we, could, we, we can't go because we're shooting the film in the north of, Ke, uh, of Kegaska. So it's very difficult. So we've been trying to, 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 to uh, reinvent. And actually, the, 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 the COVID... Uh, are, is going to stop the shooting because we will have to wait for next season. It is not going to work. Well, we've been thinking of maybe changing the way of financing and doing more shooting in, in Belgium than what we thought because we were supposed to do everything in Canada. So we actually are changing that. And so we, we're, as a producer, I'm, I'm, it's like jumping and inventing and, 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 and finding new ways. And we are asked for the CNC Belge and so we're going to do it again but we have more time now and if we have more time we can invent other things and we're changing the even the, the shooting times so we, we maybe we'll get more money from Belgium so anyway we're reinventing but it is because we didn't want it to spend also too much money on the on we have that for another film on the COVID which is uh, extra expenses that are not going to be on the screen and we have a, a lower budget than a big uh, blockbuster um, it's always difficult with um, yeah. um, because for that film it's an action film I'm always saying everything is going to be in the production of the film we really need to put the money on on this on the image not into a, a nurse or um the, 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 the yes. problem we're going to get uh, with the insurance and everything else. So maybe probably it's going to, it's, there is positive things and, 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 but I definitely won't uh, shoot now if it's more expenses that are not going to be on the screen. Okay. And you've mentioned something very important on this agenda that is uh, access for female professionals to the high budget films. As we, as yes, we, know, that's it's something a, we want to, yeah. A topic to genre, are... uh, yeah, and, and to genre film as well, mm -hmm. because I also produce genre women directors sh uh, shooting genre film. And when you're a young yes. woman director, um, you have to, um, well, it's difficult when you have a genre film. Absolutely. And for instance, Sweden, just as one of the important examples and the country that drew a lot on the agenda, does have also the scheme that tackles this high budget film access and even supports people, professionals writing scripts of that kind. But of course, a lot has to be still done on that. So thank you very much for, for this very concrete input. And uh, Juliane, what's your, what's your future thinking post COVID? Where are we going? Is it a bumpy ride, even worse than it used to be? I, I think it's a great opportunity and let me tell you why. Because I think that uh, after three months, only three months of an almost complete lockdown, um, every skeptic now uh, is acknowledging that our economic model that is based on eternal growth um, is failing and that we need to are, are, are already in the process of shifting towards a dynamic and balanced model 
which works with and not against the limited resources we have. So I think this is a great moment to mm -hmm. finally underline that our economic model is not fit to cope with uh, the consequences this pandemic has been highlighting. So what I believe is that because of this transition process that is affecting each and every area of our lives, uh, social uh, structures, uh, private uh, uh, lives, cultural and creative lives, there is a very strong need for new narratives. And I believe that there is no uh, better suited um, audience than the storytellers that uh, film uh, producers uh, work with and are themselves to provide us with these new narratives. So for me, it is a great opportunity. It's a trans transition process. We do not know where we end up, but we know we are in the process of creating something new. And I would like to uh, see the, 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 let's say also digitally based, um, you know, enhancements, which we have been seeing larger audiences, more diverse audiences with screen festivals. And uh, I think if we keep going in this direction and create a kind of physical and, and digital uh, uh, balance, uh, we might uh, end up with very interesting solutions and new, new offers also for, for audiences and creatives. Uh, and I and tell me if I'm wrong quickly, but I, I believe that all this advancement and transition cannot really only happen by its own, though it's been triggered, but probably it, it's the very moment now when we can question the normal, so to say, and really try to devise programs that are helping this process of adaptation, because that will be the the only informed way of moving forward in a more sustainable way as well. And I think that our industry has um, somewhat fully realized now how much important it is to, to create the sustainable environment. Um, this said, I, there's probably no way to reply to all that's coming in the chat. There's our good comments towards two of you, some good examples uh, happening in the US, in other countries. So let me maybe first uh, summarize three questions that are more or less on the same line towards Julie. Um, there are people, Julie, who are also having same path, like moving from acting into producing on the chat and who could really echo what, what you're saying. And they are asking you whether you have concrete um, tips to give and if there are any specific trainings that they could attend or how are you dealing with the issues of insurances right now post COVID. That's a, that's a lot, but if you can like touch base um, on those. Uh, insurance, we are looking because it was the co-production is going to be uh, also the Canadian or Belgium or French and we are actually uh, watching and in France some insurance are, are now into uh, participate to the fund of the CNC which is great news but they are actually uh, um, we, for the moment they're not um, uh, it's not easy, so we are studying it, but they're making efforts and they really want to be there. So uh, we have the chance to have different insurance we can talk to. So we are actually studying the, the, the situation. So I don't have a name, but um, um, what we were saying about in uh, the, the numeric and the solution of uh, now going with the uh, Julian with the uh, financing with also uh, the internet, the 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 FIE for the, the big um, with that's what you were saying, Julian. About now, but, but COVID, again, COVID we can we can finance by selling to also internet. Um, no, I, I meant, uh, I mean, yes, of course, of course, you can try that. No, I think that uh, digital solutions give you access to audiences in, in a way that we need to explore much, much more. Okay. So in that sense, it's a, the digital financing or you meant the, oh, I thought you meant the both. digital financing. You know, it's, it, it has both sides. If you, if you mobilize your audience early on and you turn your, uh, your, your audience into, let's say, a fans who like to support you financially, it's a win-win situation and you really you know, work closely. I think this is a great opportunity for, for value-based mm -hmm. films. 
Yeah. Uh, Julie, there, let me just throw another question on you if, as if you don't have enough, but uh, there's a question coming up. If after Me Too movement, you found it easier to, to finance uh, films uh, by, done by female, producer, female professionals, scripted or directed? I, I didn't hear you, you freeze. Hello? Do you, did you find it easier after Me Too movement to finance projects by female directors or women issues in the subject? Uh, I still find difficult when you're out of the box and but all our projects are out of the box and but definitely when um, um, uh, we have like uh, unfortunately there is a representation or a um, a, a, a woman should more do a comedy, a, a love comedy, or um, mm -hmm. it, it's more how we gonna, <laughs> for example, for Women at Sea, it's really we need a bigger budget than what she should on because it's her author film, so it's it sh we know that we we gonna we're gonna arrive to the uh, a roof of finance, and it's gonna be difficult to be. Uh, Oops, sorry. Uh, on top of that money, and but we need more money because it's going to be a, a, an action film with a lot of technical, with a boat, with a water tank, very technical things to finance. So how you do that when basically you've been in a box of uh, author films? This is two million, three million, and more than three million is difficult. So it's yeah. how you get the the change. And but I am always. Uh, um, positive thinking that digital is going to bring new solution, but we're in the in the sh in the movement, and for the moment, it's not so easy. Yeah, it's a transition, and it's it's, it's a transition, transition that brings a lot of knowledge uh, requirement as well. Uh, I would like to address the viewers for all the questions that relate to our network. Please just go on internet on evennetwork.com, uh, as you can see in my bar, and uh, just email them all to us and every we can answer there so we don't have to take time now and now i will read out um julie juliane one question to you from one of the first people uh, writing on the chat that is by a female founder of a tech startup for the creative industry the challenge has also been to find funding for advertising budget to let the women creatives know there is a platform created to support them. How do you propose we solve the catch 2020 issue in this? And I think this relates to many other startups as well. The, 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 the connotation between behind the question. Yes, exactly. I mean, if, if there is no money available that you can uh, use and spend on increasing your outreach and uh, kind of furthering your way to connect um, with your clients and uh, uh, audiences, <clears throat> it could always be interesting to look at um, cross communication possibilities to team up with, um, you know, like minded, uh, well positioned um, companies that uh, try to achieve something similar or complementary and to see if by com combining uh, resources and, and uh, strategies, you know, if, if you can, um, without spending more money, reach your goal of, um, you know, spreading the word and uh, developing more visibility for your platform. I'm a great believer of um, collaboration and, and the, the, let's say, articulated benefits in uh, partnering with um, maybe also bigger companies, but that again needs um, a, a kind of value proposition oriented type of analysis. And if you then would, uh, let's say, open a dialogue with uh, such um, company, they would quickly understand if your offer is for them and if it brings added value. If it will, then I think you have a good opportunity to um, embark on that journey. I am afraid we will need to wrap now. Uh, I think one very concrete takeaway, the first one is that this is a subject that needs time, that I, I'm sure that on our end and probably on the end of uh, Creative Europe media as well, it's quite clear already that we could go on talking and Sarah, I'm looking at you now. There's a lot that we can um, dig, have a deeper dive and really go into nitty gritty of the problems. 
but uh, slowly we need to, to wrap. Uh, and uh, I would uh, like to echo what uh, Julie said, what Juliane suggested very strongly, and um, finish on a, on a positive note. Let's really try to use this as post-pandemic as an opportunity. And if we've been doing some wrong things, and if we've been not enough open and too self-centric on different parts of the industry. Let's also use it as a moment when we question those normals. Uh, luckily, there's a lot on the side of media and also on the private, within the private sector research, which shows that female leadership is associated with productivity, profitability, uh, grows, a responsible innovation, all these words that we like to hear, but there's still a lot to be achieved. And I hope that people like yourself, but a lot of great women out there. We had um, comments on the chat from Jamaica, from US, men, women, uh, agreeing with you, giving you supporting messages. And it would be wonderful, of course, to reply to all of it, but it also shows that there is a demand and there is an interest to keep this conversation going. So unless, Sarah, you want to say something, I... Yes, please, I just want to say two words very, uh, sure. very quickly. Of course, I want to thank you all again. We, uh, you've been, uh, it's been so interesting and uh, I think very important for all the audience and for us policymakers to hear these testimonies. And of course, also I want to add that uh, it is especially important in this context, uh, because uh, as you know, the commission and Commissioner Thierry Breton has proposed a major and ambitious uh, recovery plan and the new multi-annual budget for the European Commission. And it will mean that um, money will be available but not only as subsidies, but as loans and equity. And I think women entrepreneurs has especially uh, the um, opportunity to um, learn, I think, uh, with, uh, let's say, the capacity building and to be stronger with uh, getting and accessing this money. So um, in this context, I think this topic was particularly important. I wanted to navigate a little bit that direction. So thank you very much for making it a very clear uh, once again in the end, the angle that you are trying to nurture, which is very pragmatic and uh, should be really welcomed. Uh, for us as uh, partners of on this talk, uh, it's important to, to empower, to provide uh, training to see more women making a change. So whatever uh, associations like ours could contribute, I'm very, very sure that a lot of people are out there who could be part of this constructive dialogue. And all of that would, you, two of you, Juliane and Julie, you've been today in the spotlight. I was just here to, to drive a little bit the conversation. So thank you very much for your time. It's also the last day of, of the Maché. So this is the, the last showcase, Sarah, right? Of, um, yes, right. of course. Uh, so let's really uh, finish. Thank our viewers. Um, this talk will be available online later on. So there have been some issues uh, about it, but uh, be assured that you can watch it. And um, let's hope that uh, we will meet in person soon uh, in more sensitive understanding of the changes that we need to drive in the future together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, Sarah. Ciao, Julie. Ciao, Tamara. We need Good networking. Time. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>